Hello everyone, good afternoon um, and welcome. My name's Maria Spees, I'm the co-CEO of Holland IQ and welcome to the panel, um, A Better Freshman Year. Today we're going to be talking about and focusing on gap year and all the alternatives, what's happening in the market, who's doing what, what the issues are. It's wonderful to have a panel that's coming from all different, all different sectors, all different parts and all different perspectives of the industry. And I'm going to go and ask the panel to very quickly introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Um, Henry, how about we start with you? Yeah, thanks, Maria. Uh, Henry Broadus, I'm the Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Public Affairs at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, there I oversee multiple offices, including our enrollment uh, division. Great, Mitch. Hey everyone, uh, Mitch Gordon, president of Virto Education. Uh, hello from Portland, Oregon, with clear skies. <laughs> Carrie Lynn. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Carrie Aldridge, um, coming to you from East Tennessee. I serve as the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management at the University of Tennessee, lead our recruitment and outreach, scholarships and financial aid, and centralized student services areas. Nice to be here. Thanks, Carrie. Bobby. Hello, uh, Bobby Andrews, Senior Director of Enrollment Initiatives at Rose Holman Institute of Technology in Terre Haute, Indiana. And Ethan. Hi there. Uh, Ethan Knight, Executive Director of the Gap Year Association. Amongst many other things, we're a membership-based nonprofit headquartered up here in Portland with an office in Boston, and we are the Standards Development Organization title holder, which means we hold the titles for Gap Year standards and are recognized by the U.S. Department of Justice to do that. Great, thank you so much. Well, there's a, there's a lot to talk about today. Um, the, the panel is titled A Better Freshman Year and our topic is gap year. Even putting those two things together is interesting. So let's jump straight in. Um, recently, The Guardian wrote, one thing's for certain, a successful gap year in the age of COVID-19 is going to require imagination and lateral thinking. And so, so this speaks to, um, you know, doing gap year differently and even reconceptualising the whole thing, let alone re reconceptualising potentially freshman year. And so I'm interested in starting off getting your thoughts on what are those, um, you know, imaginative and, and lateral thinking solutions that you're seeing um, in the market in, in, with, respect to, um, with respect to gap year alternatives or initiatives. Um, who'd like to start us off with some of the most interesting things you're seeing or your own experiences, actually, of what's happening with Gap Year? Well, I mean, just to start us off real briefly, um, um, we hold weekly meetings with our members and get a, a pulse for what's been going on. And I think, um, um, broadly speaking, I'm kind of calling COVID the, the, the renaissance of the Gap Year. Um, we're watching um, the onshoring of Gap Year take place for the longest time. I think it was always wrapped up in this idea of um, going international, and I, I don't think that's going to, to change once the, the lid comes off with COVID, but what we're seeing is tremendous innovation take place. So, you know, we talk about um, necessity being the mother of invention. Well, there's a lot of inventing happening right now, and beautifully enough, a lot of um, repurposing. So I've seen a lot of like semester schools or camps or things where maybe they interface with this population, make an easy pivot. Um, um, but I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about the advent of online. and. Um, the advantage is that that's going to open the doors towards greater accessibility. More youth can avail themselves of these benefits, and we all know how beneficial they are to the students that, that directly are impacted, but of course even the ripples, right? The, the people they come in touch with um, once they hit the college campus or their communities. Um, I'll just start us off with that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Mitch, what about yourself? You've been working in this space for a while. Sure, yeah. I think, I think what's really interesting here is that COVID, you talked about some new models, a better freshman year, and the impact that COVID will have both in the short term and the long term. My prediction of the impact COVID will have is ultimately that as a society, we'll be much more open to new ideas and new models. And I think that that is one small silver lining um, in what's happening right now. So when we talk about the title of the panel right now, a better freshman year and gap years, it's how do we think as a society uh, about what we want our higher education system to look like? We've been very entrenched for a long time now in a four-year model, and that will, you know, continue on in some format. 
But I think parents and students and high school counselors and everyone are looking for a wide variety of reasons of the fact that we do need some different models. And I think a good place to start there is what do we ultimately want higher education to serve society as? Like, what is the goal of higher education? In my mind, that's um, to create a more robust, uh, transparent democracy. It's to create a citizenship that wants to serve each other uh, and create a better world. And so if we start that way, well, what kinds of experiences um, if we if we find an area of agreement there that that's a mutual shared goal, what do we want our 18-year-olds to have? What kind of experiences do we want them to have in this very strict 18 to 22, I must go to college at this age, I must stay on this path, doesn't always serve everybody. Um, and so I think that that will open us up to a lot of ideas. And I would expect some of these things we can predict coming out of COVID. We're seeing some things that my organization is doing and the other organizations and universities, institutions in this in, in this panel are doing. But I suspect we're going to see some very different models and a whole bunch of innovation here um, that come out of this that, that we can't always predict. And some of it will be some really interesting um, models that serve our young people and then ultimately our society well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's great. I, I, I think um, you know, what you're saying is, or what I'm hearing is there is a potential for, um, because of um, the situation we're in, for um, colleges to, and students, I guess, to reinvent some of the ways in which um, they approach not just a gap year, but college itself, the college experience itself, um, through the vehicle, perhaps, of a gap year type experience. Um, what about those of you who are working at, at universities? Um, what are you experiencing? What are students looking for? Um, what are the types of initiatives that you're seeing? Maybe Carrie, perhaps start with you. Yeah, I'll add to, to the great remarks from Ethan and Mitch that I think COVID, like it or not, has forced us to innovate in ways we haven't had to before, which is really exciting. And I feel what, what we've experienced as a campus at Tennessee will be a better university on the other end. I don't think there's a going back to normal. I think there's a going forward and creating meaningful experiences for students that look different. Um, what I wanna see from students, and we do have some students that took, took a gap year and we're partnering with Virto and creating different pathways for our students to enter the university experience. I want to know they had an immersive experience that was meaningful and that better prepares them to enter our campus community and make a difference on our campus. And I just, I think about the experiences that our students are having and the challenges they're facing that I think will make them a stronger student long term and a stronger citizen long term. So those are the things that are exciting to me, both the ways we're being forced to change on the higher ed side but also how our students are learning to engage and pers persevere through some of these challenges. Yeah, yep. right. Thank you. you know, one observation I'd make um, consistent with what uh, my colleagues have shared is in a typical year at William & Mary, and we're a small um, you know, selective public, we would see 12 to 20 gap years that would be approved. So pretty, pretty modest, even though our bar for what we would approve for that is actually quite low. We, we like, you know, when a student has shown the initiative and has set up a, an experience or has an idea for, for what he or she wants to do, we're, we're, we're very happy to enable that because we think it contributes to student success when they matriculate. Uh, this year, you know, we saw more than double that uh, for the fall, uh, so 40-ish. Um, we saw equally another 40 that wanted to defer to, defer to spring, sometimes out of necessity, inability to get a visa, um, but back to Ethan's point about the mother of invention, you know, students were motivated to create alternative experiences out of that uh, necessity. And, you know, this is something that I think one uh, takeaway for me is that it is still hard for many students to figure out on their own how to do it. And I think there is still great demand. Uh, you know, I, I'm a fan of Virto's model. We're a partner of Virto for more turnkey solutions that are going to expand gap year options, especially for students that may think those are not affordable or just not the kind of path uh, that, that's open to them. So I would share the optimism that that might be, as our president likes to say, we're developing new muscles as we learn to operate in the pandemic. And I think this might be one uh, that we want to make sure we're continuing to exercise in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This, um, 
there's so many questions and comments I've got off that, but let's, let's go. Um, Bobby, what are your experiences and thoughts here? Sure. So I've got a little bit of different perspective in that I'm at a small engineering school with a curriculum on a quarter basis. So students are really like probably the most practical young people I've ever met in my life here. But having been at a liberal arts institution prior, um, some serious differences in the types of students that want to take part in a, in a gap year. But I think, again, COVID is forcing everyone to rethink how and what is acceptable, what, is, what flexibility looks like, and then the societal pressures that are now really mounting to, to have people learn and push themselves outside of the regular boxes that they live in and have existed in to this point um, are going to force, um, as we've seen some institutions try to adopt their own gap year programs, but these adjacencies to higher ed, that people that can do it and do it really well, that are gonna be how students supplement the experiences that they're not getting or they don't think they're getting because they're getting kind of pushed through a, a curriculum or an academic planning because of the concerns with getting out of school on time and the costs associated with that. That I think, um, you know, places or groups like Virto are, are certainly gonna become an option and it's gonna be, it's gonna, I think many institutions are gonna be forced to um, identify that they're they're weak in certain areas, especially in the societal development point early on in the college career. That the reality is that students aren't getting everything they expect, and they do view those that know it and those that become aware of it that a gap year can do a whole lot more to revolutionize their growth and maturity that they they just can't get in a classroom. And so I think. We have yet to see what it's going to look like over the next five to 10 years. Mm. I mean, one of the things we, we've been sort of circling around and talking about is a few things. One is a gap year traditionally was a year before you started college and you did a whole range of things um, to develop your you know, worldliness, maybe intercultural. You had different experiences, grew up a little bit. Um, before you dived into college. So you extended college, essentially, the years until you graduated. Um, and what we're seeing and what we're talking about is um, gap year experiences, um, you know, supporting the development of um, different types of skills, whether they be employability skills or um, social skills or whatever it may be. I read recently... Um, that a, a university, one university is building like virtu a virtual 15 week virtual program, gap, gap year program. I don't know that it's gap years, 15 weeks uh, online to explore college life. They get credits, um, collaborate with um, professors and mentors to build out holistic well-being, you know, understand their career options, do those sorts of things. And I thought when I read that, that sounds like what university is supposed to be, <laughs> the whole university, not the gap year. And so what, uh, I'm, uh, what are your thoughts on a gap year is not going to be a gap year? I mean, it's perhaps it's just terminology, but actually these experiences are and possibly should be embedded all the way through a university program. What are your thoughts on the integration of these things? Who wants to jump in? Let's. My, my wild dream is, is, and I think sort of, you know, we're watching the sort of the how do you call it? Sort of the 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 chapter oriented nature of higher education start to start start to take off, such that you know just previously on the on the previous session to ours was a, a question a comment conversations around transfer credits and um, isn't it silly that sort of a calculus class at William and Mary is versus a calculus class at Reed or Portland State University? It's a calculus class, right? Like like it doesn't really benefit you to go from one to the other. So. Um, um, I don't know, I think we are sort of watching an interesting time and one of the, the sort of the dreams where I would envision this to go eventually is, you know, maybe leveraging blockchain um, is, is eight semesters, eight different experiences, one degree cobbled together by one institution. So, so that there's purpose towards it, um, um, but it is much more of a choose your own adventure. And I think that's one of the things that, that, that one of the reasons why we see the gap year has such great outcomes is it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's a choose your own adventure. So it really is about sort of cultivating a deeper sense of who you are, what your unique gifts are, and sort of what it is in the world. You know, it occurs to me, Maria, we haven't actually defined or talked about what is a gap year? What, what are we talking about? Is it 
I mean, because from my experience, it is an experiential thing. It has to have some degree of sort of getting your hands into it. So online can do that with wraparound pieces. But, you know, like I like to say, if you work at Dairy Queen for a summer, um, um, it, it's a great work experience, but in, in and of itself isn't a great gap year. Um, something different is happening in that experience. Yeah, great. That's a, that's a good, uh, you know, I think the definitions, because I think actually the definitions are changing. Um, are can we, can it sounded like what Ethan just said is it need not be a gap and it need not be a year. <laughs> right. No, it's true. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I think to add to that, it's funny, there's very few terms in, in, our, in our world that are more ambiguous than the term gap year. I mean, it can incorporate so many things. And I think it's also really misleading sometimes because it, it implies a gap. But if we just look at it like graduate high school roughly at 18, should you start college immediately and should you feel that pressure to start immediately or to Ethan's point and the point many people are making here is, is it actually more beneficial to your own personal growth as a human being and what you want to do in the world when you graduate college to take a pause between high school and starting college and do something that might not involve credit but that is incredibly fulfilling and deepening of your relationship with yourself and the world and what you want to do when you arrive on college. Do you want to do a hybrid thing where you're getting credit, um, but also doing something uh, along the veins of, of, of self-discovery, as Ethan said? And I think if we just expand what we allow all of ourselves to do and our 18-year-olds to do without the pressure of must starting college at 18, we'd actually have a lot of better outcomes um, for giving people a little bit more freedom um, to consider different options. I mean, one of the things that I've, I've seen start to happen, so I saw this happen with study abroad and gap year as, you know, freshman courses were starting to take off and study abroad providers were being asked by colleges to now run freshman courses. And the study abroad providers came to the gap year industry and they were saying like, hey, we can do programming, but we don't know what we're doing with your age demographic. We tried to just shoehorn an 18 year old into sort of our existing program and it didn't work. And I fear that we're seeing colleges try and do the same thing, right? We're gonna, we're gonna launch a gap year because sort of we need to get into that game. Unfortunately, they're, they're just not gonna do it as well as those who sort of, I mean, there's just a lot that goes into this work. And when you're working with someone at this specific age range, you know, identity is just as important as, as your major. And if you're not having the identity and purpose conversations, then, then the major conversation, it, it, it's, it's, it's much harder to get to, like, you know, maybe six years of, of, a, of a college degree, a um, lot harder to get to. And that's why I think we're seeing, you know, some of the data that we're seeing on, on our side, I mean, students who take a gap year, you know, their GPAs are improved, their time to graduation is, in, I think it's a median of 3.75 years, an average of four years. Um, and there is some self-selection bias to that data, but, but, but for me, here's one of the like, best parts of, of what we're finding in our data. And, and this has been corroborated. I, I in some ways almost wish this was different, but what we're finding in our data is that it, it matters less the specific activities that an individual has before. And I want to pull this back because all those things are, are great. And the, the, the statistics, like you said, the outcomes are there. And sort of what a shame that that has to be outside university those outcomes about choice and finding yourself and having great experiences and, and, and learning about different things. And isn't that, isn't that what university is? Do we have to create something external before or after or, you know, separately to the university experience to get those outcomes? That's a shame. Universities, this is what they should do. Um, but what are the, what are the students want? Those practical students, what are they looking to do? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Bobby? I feel like I'm getting baited into a, 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 a an indictment of my entire industry, um, which I, I I could levy real quick if we'd like, but I think uh, for the I'll, I'll use some discretion. <laughs> the 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 reality I, I think is we know that it's not happening on our campus, and and frankly the resources have been. Is, I can speak from the smaller private institution side, but I imagine it's pretty similar at the statewide. Uh, institutions is that mental health has been the primary focus in student academic life and continues and really for the foreseeable future will continue to be the largest new contingent of resources and people on our campuses. So to think we can devote time to somehow spinning up what is an, its own industry 
on our own campus. Well, I, I agree, you're right, we should be doing that on our campus and providing those opportunities for personal exploration and, and identifying self and sense of being and, and, and place. But it, it's just, it, even in the best places institutionally across our country, it's still a struggle and, and it's gonna continue to be as resources become more and more scarce, both with the need for shifts but also the, the deficits that institutions are running now and the continual cost constraint, which I don't think is going to go away anytime soon, and the pressure on tuition and fees and revenue um, coming from the tuition and fee side of things. Like the reality is, uh, you know, an outsourced piece of this to experts who have devoted their professional lives and their work to honing the development of people as a supplement to our university college structure. And I think, frankly, is is the reality at this point we need to face because trying to bring it in house, I don't, I, I just, I don't believe there's enough resource and personal human capital available to do it well and help young people receive what we want them to have out of out of that transformational student life side of things. And that's not to denigrate student life professionals. Like I said, I think there's just so much on their plate and really super critical mental health needs that so many of our young people are coming in with that need to be addressed that they it's it's hard to find time and resources to commit to a truly thoughtful intentional developmental process that that is not tied to some performance metric or an easily quantifiable success marker that you, you can't you can't put a number necessarily on the the impact of being in a in a community with indigenous people and seeing the plight of them and, and getting your hands dirty, so to speak, if we wanna use some of the cliche gap year thoughts, that they're just too transformative to put a, a number on. And, and unfortunately, everything is tied to that. And um, I just, I see our institutions as not nimble enough to be able to provide that in a meaningful, enriching way, like, like we need it to be. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Carol. Oh, I would just also add that when we think about affordability for our students too, for us as independent campuses to stand up a program like Virto, um, can we make it affordable for our students? You know, I, I come from a large public flagship university. We're very traditional. We just celebrated 225 years. And this is, you know, COVID has made us rethink things. We have to innovate and think flexible but we're also an access institution. We serve a population that's 30% Pell eligible. And so one of the big priorities for us is thinking about access, affordability, and student success. Time to degree, right? We want our students to graduate on time. So Mitch talked about this a little bit, but I wanna circle back because I think one of the things that was so exciting for us as we thought about a partnership with Virto is it really is a gap year without the gap. Um, we have to be real about the pressures that our students face as far as entering education, time to degree, staying on track, getting started. And as much as I think some of our students would love to have the opportunity to not have to worry about getting credit for a year or half a year, the reality is many of our students need to get started. And this is a way for them to just take a different path towards even that graduating on time, retaining at higher levels. Um, but it's doing it in a way that's just transformational for their experience. And to jump in, you know, Carrie emphasized, right, like quality, it's also scale, right? I mean, I think about the size of our institution to, to be able to run those kinds of programs at scale would really just not, just not work. And so, you know, from our standpoint, partnership is really uh, better. Uh, and, and I will also say, you know, I think it's great. We've focused on student interest, which should be, you know, at the center, but from the institutional interest standpoint, uh, a big reason for our excitement about something like the Virto model uh, is that we've got capacity in the spring that we don't have in the fall. So our ability, you know, this year to offer our wait list, which is a really strong, great group of students, the option to think about a turnkey solution to a fall semester experience with guaranteed admission in the spring, uh, is a great enrollment management tool. And by the way, when it comes to selecting or filtering from a wait list, you know, 
boy, I'll, I'll use the, the quality that has a student get excited about an experience in Costa Rica over splitting hairs on test scores, essays, and transcripts for what's already a pre-qualified, very, very strong group to begin with. So I think you know, that, that really excites me too, which is the, the ability for universities to seek partners to try to create these kinds of experiences could actually have uh, you know, a real impact on the character of the student body. Incredibly well put. I have nothing more to add to the kind words you to share there about my organization. But no, but uh, I would, I, I want to drill in on one point that you both made because and I'm so happy to hear you make it. We, we talk about it a lot, but as a higher ed field, but access, inclusion, diversity on college campuses, I mean, I, there is an opportunity now for us coming out of COVID to go in one of two directions, one, a less equal higher education system and one, a more equal higher education system. But I would argue that at the root of so many of the problems in our country is that inequity in higher ed. And we have to use this as an opportunity to do that better. I think all of us as leaders and anybody who's watching this as leaders, we have to do better. We'll ultimately all live in a better, safer society if we do that well. And um, yeah, that's something I'm really ded dedicated to. When we look at the data around um, you know, who we are ultimately serving in higher ed, we look at the people, many of you have seen the data, but disproportionately serving the higher income brackets of this country rather than the lower income brackets. And we have to make that change. And if we're talking about something like a better freshman year or gap years, I think that has to be a part of every discussion. And any new models that our institutions are supporting, I think that we have to insist that they are equitable models. And we will all benefit over time by insisting in that. I mean, one of the things that that's for, I to, couldn't agree with you more, Mitch. And I, I love that, that we have the access panel, which is awesome because um, it should be, I mean, all of us should be doing the access keynote, right? Um, um, internally and externally. But one of the, just, I, I wanna relay one story with you just real briefly that, that I think is both a cautionary tale for higher ed as well as for gap year, um, really any kind of educational environment. And that's when cost becomes so high. Um, um, I had, a, I had a, a colleague who was in New York, he was, he was a teacher there, he ran a, a great experiential program. Um, he, he had to charge a bunch of money in order to make the ends meet. And one of the things that he, he ended up saying was, was for the, the more money that he ended up charging, he ended up, he had students come back to him sort of really proportionally, almost saying, I paid my money, now, now do your education thing on me. And, and when money starts to become sort of part of the transactional process of education, I think we, we lose the enthusiasm, the, the participatory nature that it takes for positive outcomes. Um, and so when students are paying a bunch of money, and I'll be honest, in most outdoor ed fields, you're going to see, you know, cost per program day ranging between 80 to $200 a day. Um, and that's not cheap. That's, that's not something the average family can easily put out. So, so, so important things like the way that Virto's done a great job leveraging access to FAFSA, um, those kinds of anything that we all can do to bring the cost down. I think it's not just about ex sort of the, the inclusionary nature of, of, of more people. It's also the human nature of being invested in your own outcomes. Um, and if it's a transactional process, you'll, you'll never get there. Right. Well, well said. Thanks, everyone. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier, and I know that where where um, the session here is about 45 minutes and um, we're half an hour in. And so soon enough, we'll start seeing some questions come through from the from the audience. I can't see any there yet. Um, but just while that's happening, um, one of the things we talked about uh, earlier was uh, in our pre uh, prep session was the changing nature of university students themselves from, you know, there is a focus, of course, so important on those um, straight out of school, uh, school leavers, 18 year olds. But the reality, I guess, is that universities are, uh, are you know, not filling up, but there's more and more mature age students um, studying part time, ongoing upskilling. What does that mean for these types of um, I'm not even going to say gap year because that doesn't even sound right if, if you're an ongoing student working and so on. But those experiences, um, you know, that we've been talking about that are exemplified through a gap year. What does that mean? Uh, the changing demographics, do you think, for these types of um, objectives and experiences that are typified in a, in a gap year programs? It's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll just open it. Um, the 
so so broadly speaking, I think when a lot of us started the gap year work, we, we were building programs for millennials. And then we kept running programs for millennials um, and we started seeing sort of worse results. And then we kept running programs for millennials and we started seeing worse results. And it was like, what's going on? And it was sort of, you know, an aha moment to realize that we're actually running programs now for Gen Z. And so, for instance, for a variety of reasons, um, um, we're seeing the, the locations that students are traveling are, are changing now. The duration of time that they're out traveling on program is much reduced. Um, um, it used to be sort of that the golden, the golden window was a 14 or a 16 week program, and now it's sort of hovering closer to 10 or even late, you know, less. Um, and so I think from like broadly speaking from an educational perspective, we always want to meet each student where they're at. That's where the greatest potential for, for growth and transformation are. Um, um, but but uh, you know, from a programming perspective, we have to be savvy to, to what they want and what they're largely what the risk tolerance is. So uh, thinking about it as much more iterative, right? Um, um, thinking about how can we provide programming for them that, that will get them excited to engage in the next step rather than you know, shooting the moon like millennials were taught. Um, Gen Z seem much more inclined to be a cautionary tale. So um, I'm hearing from a lot more Gen Z folks, I'm going to be an accountant. I'm still going to hold my dream as being a sort of a, a rocket pilot, but I'm, I'm going to be an accountant. That's what I'm pursuing in my degree. Whereas millennials who were much more likely to say, no, I'm all behind a rocket person. Um, um, that's just sort of not what we're seeing anymore. Um, and there's a practicality to that, that I really can't fault them on um, that hopefully will, will, will portend well. I mean, let's be honest, with climate change amongst other, all of the other many sort of global challenges ahead, um, um, a, a sort of a little bit more of an iterative nature um, that's more cautionary probably is a bad idea. How about others on the, the sort of the generational divide? I mean, students that you're seeing, you know, go on programming or um, applying even. Mm. Parental involvement. But what else is going to jump in? I'm happy to add a couple of thoughts. I think I, I'll reframe the question, answer your question, but a slightly different one too. Which I think a lot of what we're talking about here is also paths to jobs, um, paths to gainful employment. You know, and the ability to support ourselves and our families, and you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, all those things. And there's going to be some different paths there. I think one of the things that's really going to shift, likely, um, for people of all different ages, is employers who. Uh, look at a four-year degree a little differently, right? And when we've started to see that uh, that shift a little bit, right? Um, places like Google saying, uh, and government jobs saying that maybe we won't require a four-year degree. What will they require? What are the ways that we measure that someone is ready? Um, I expect, just that these are a few general predictions, but there might be a rise in certificate programs or, you know, short-term credentials that we might see come out of this and, and universities might be out front. And we're already starting to see some growth in that, but it hasn't reached, you know, fully mainstream yet. And I think we're, I, I, I hope, this is, I'm, I'm going to just say that I'm rooting for this, that we see a little bit more of an interest in soft skills and life experience, and that that's something that employers start to really emphasize and care about, and that we, we talk about that seeing someone come out of college at 23 or a little bit later in life um, with a little bit more seasoning and travel or service, volunteering, um, those type of life experiences. We really value that in our leaders, that we really value that in our employees. And if employers start looking for that and saying that they want that and then putting some real data behind that, I think that that will be really beneficial in actually sending a signal to our young people or non-traditional people like you, your question, original question, Leslie and Maria, that those are life experiences that we should all have to make us both job and, and life ready. I think, I think we'll all benefit from that. And I think we'll really start to see some different models. There are some that we can expect. I think we'll see some really, uh, some in interesting things that we really won't expect that we can't predict now a couple of years down the line. I, I just had to, I wanted to jump in a little bit. This more broadly about my experience rather than my current institution, um, but thinking about those young people who come out at 18 years old and, and have the opportunity to get further development and maturation through these experiences, as we think about the non-traditional, the continuing ed, the veteran populations, people that have been out and lived a, a, a real life experience that's more than the traditional, you know, 18 year old might have coming on campus, there are some competitive disadvantages to trying to enroll that population 
uh, in particular, you know, the 25 year old veteran who's coming back, who doesn't frankly want to be in a classroom with a bunch of 18 year olds who are really immature, you know, stereotypical, but the, the reality is they, they will choose schools that have higher veteran populations because they feel like they're going to be in a cohort of students that are more like them in their life at that point. And I think being able to demonstrate a much more mature student body, a more developed student body, is going to provide those institutions seeking to enroll the non-traditional age. You know, if if credentialing becomes specifically what what employers at Google and the federal government require, at some point they're probably going to want to go back to school to get a degree because there will be a barrier somewhere that says you need to have a four-year degree. So. I think any way we can d develop the population of 18 to 22 year olds is only going to benefit those enrollment endeavors in the future that are focusing on 23 to 50 year olds. The only thing I, I would add is, I mean, yeah, you know, we know that the post baccalaureate market in education, you know, is the fastest growing. And I think even fairly traditional places, I mean, such as William and Mary, are doing more and are exploring opportunities to do things in certificate programs, you know, in partnership with employers uh, and, and the like. And I, I do think what is a potentially exciting connection to make is some of the innovation happening in gap year that are neither gaps nor years uh, experiences and then what that looks like over the course of a career. Where is there a similar not a gap, not a year experience, you know, with an employer, you know, that is boosting skills, uh, you know, um, equipping uh, people to advance within within organizations, because, you know, I think it's on both ends of the baccalaureate degree experience, there, there are similar disruptions and opportunities uh, occurring. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely um, agree with 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 that. Um, Where there's one more thing I wanted to talk about, but I don't want to do that in um, uh, and not get to the any questions from the audience. I can't see any questions coming through in the chat um, as my chat's disabled. So if you see any questions there, we can we can jump in and um, and answer them. So have a look in your chat boxes there to see if we have any questions coming through. And until then, I wanted to um, also talk about one of the things we talked about earlier was uh, gap year. Now, the, the whole term is up in the air after this panel, but gap year, traditionally, um, fly overseas and in, immerse yourself in a new culture, experience and grow up and all those sorts of things, it, it, it develop some independent skills and so on like that. Of course, that's all off the table with COVID. No one's flying anywhere. Um, and one of the things that we talked about earlier, and I think Bobby, you, you mentioned it in our previous discussion, was um, a, a more focus on what's happening in your own neighbourhoods mm -hmm. and having, doing, um, giving, um, experiencing, um, volunteering it may be, things that are happening right in the hyper-local area where need is, where there's need. It could be volunteering, it could be uh, all sorts of things. Um, are we seeing some of that yet? Um, or at all, um, what type of, uh, what are students thinking about, you know, giving back in terms of seeing people in their own areas struggling in, in, in all sorts of ways and perhaps b becoming part of local communities and groups and so on and developing those experiences in what's not the gap, not the year. What are you seeing in, in, in that area? Anyone have any comments on, on that localization? Well, I will weigh in here a little bit. You you mentioned a magic word for me, and that's um, volunteering. And that's our namesake. We're the University of Tennessee Volunteers. So that is just part of the fabric of who we are as a university. Um, and another reason why I think I connected to the vision of Virto and this sense of immersion and kind of community engagement. Um, we're also, you know, being located in East Tennessee, we're near Appalachia. We have all kinds of opportunities as communities to engage where we are. Um, we talk about blooming where you're planted, and that's something we've talked a lot about with our students during COVID, um, is kind of focusing on what kind of change, what kind of impact, positive impact can we make here? And 
We um, launched a couple years ago an initiative called Volunteering with the Balls, where all across the country where we have large alumni bases and we have prospective students and we have current students, we do a day of service. And this grew into actually a global day of service um, where you know we have a group of students abroad and we're all um, wearing our kind of volunteer hearts that day and giving back to the communities where we are. Now we've been with COVID that has to look different than it's looked in the past, but I think you're exactly right, Maria. We need to kind of step back and look around in our own communities. And we're seeing a high level of engagement among our students wanting to do that. Um, so we're kind of working to figure out what that, what that looks like. And it's been, it's been very meaningful and impactful. Right. Thank you so much for those comments, Carrie. I just add quickly to that that you know definitely see it's a beautiful thing that young people are interested in giving back and service and, and making a better world. And our models haven't caught up to the desire of young people to have that impact and giving back to the world. And it would be it would be great to see some more volunteer service, human connective in the community based models that have credit and give back and um, you know. It's great to see Tennessee and Carrie leading, leading with that, but it would be great to see more models like that. We're, we're seeing that kind of, and I'm, I'm very new to Rose Holman, but one of the really interesting things I learned real quick here was one of our academic programs, our engineering design program had, has a component in the first year where students are, they design toys and tools for developmentally disabled and disabled children in our community and then bring those tools and toys out to them, whether it be for therapeutic use or just their school or just for fun. And then they, after, after they've done that, they build similarly, they help work with local nonprofits for adults with disabilities to help build things for their home for work so that they can live normal lives. And I learned of this uh, three, four weeks ago when I first got here. And now in my interactions with students, prospective students, both from the US and internationally, they want to do parts of that program, even though they want to be an electrical engineer. And it's not the major. They're like, can I still take part in this? Because I really feel like I, I want to do this. I want to help these children or I want to help these adults. So we're seeing it kind of permeate out of what one. 